Welcome to another one of our adult formation series. We're thrilled and excited to have with us the Reverend Dr. Keith Powell, priest associate here at CHD, along with roles at other churches and other faculties, but we're very excited for him to start this three-week course through the Gospel of John. Without further ado, here's Pete. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Okay. Um, so you've got the, the outline. I'm hoping we can get mostly through it. Um, I was coached this morning on what I should say. Uh, I'm not good at taking coaching. Um, and, and, and the coach realizes that. The, uh, you know, John's, um, John's gospel is one that I've avoided studying um, for 43 years. Um, it's supposed to be the favorite gospel of, the, of, of all Anglicans. I've never figured out quite why. Um, and so I was hoping that somebody else would do John, but they didn't, so I did it. Um, and it's an interesting text because a lot of what was talked about when I was in seminary in the mid-70s is no longer talked about. Uh, so it's a very, we, we come from a very different place. But the purpose of John is given in uh, chapter 20 of John, verse 30, where, uh, where we read, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which were not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Now I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping you don't just read the three or four chapters that I've that we'll be covering, but read the whole thing, and read it with that verse in mind, that the purpose of the gospel is to help you and me become disciples. Uh, and what we'll be talking about is what it means to be a disciple. I have been uh, profoundly um, impacted the last two or three years by Richard Rohr. And if you're not already reading his meditation and you would like to add something brief to your diet every day, uh, he sends out a meditation six days a week. And he talks about the captivity of the church um, when it was recognized as the church by Constantine in 313. He says that since that time, until this time, the church has not been the church of Jesus, it's not been, it's, it's not cared what Jesus cared about. That up through 312, people in the church were the poor, uh, the powerless, the afflicted, the downtrodden. And then when Constantine said, okay, you're the church, tells me what it, th what it means. Well, nobody could tell him, so they gathered a bunch of bishops together and they put together the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, which uh, one of which we read every Sunday. Do you know which one? Yes. Oh, very good. And the other of which we say is authoritative. So at a baptism or confirmation, we always read the Apostles' Creed, but every Sunday we read it. And um, uh, G. Ernest Wright, uh, not G. Ernest Wright, um, E.N.T. Wright, thank you, um, has talked about the captivity of the church by the... Um, philosophical meanderings of the of the creeds and he's tried to free the bible from the creeds that's one of his underlying things why several years ago when we did the change in the, in the uh, services did we put less emphasis on the apostles versus the nice we did we did not uh, we didn't change the emphasis no we did well it seemed like it no no what we did change was we changed to a plural pronoun first person plural from a first person singular. Because the Nicene Creed in Greek is we, not I. Um, that we did change. Uh, that, may make, that may have made a distinction because the Apostles' Creed is still I. But no, we, didn't, we didn't change the emphasis. Um, there's, there's still, yes? Yeah. You, you, if, when you started, you, you, you mentioned the two, the dichotomy between us, the before, you were in the seminary, yep. or when you were in seminary, and now, what what was the emphasis when you were in seminary, and what how I okay, one of the Okay, thank you. I will get to that in just a moment. What I want to say is that after 313, <clears throat> the church, when Constantine recognized it, said, oh, 
You know, we suddenly have power. And the church became all about preserving its power. So what color do American bishops, American Episcopal bishops dress in? Purple. Yeah, royal purple. They're princes of the church. Um, they are very, you know, uh, particular about uh, how they are dressed and how they are called. Uh, fortunately, being a priest, I don't have to pay attention to any of that. Um, <clears throat> but they, uh, they do notice. Um, so, uh, but anyway, uh, that's all by way of just saying that what we are trying to do now, as opposed to what we did when I was in seminary, was to actually read the Bible. There, are, there were three men who were absolutely crucial in getting us to read the Bible, and they, were all, they all did this in the 60s. So we should have been doing that while I was in seminary, but we weren't. One, two of them taught at Yale. Hans Frey was an Episcopalian, a theologian, and he wrote a book called The Eclipse of Biblical Narrative. And what he was saying was that biblical scholars were doing themselves and teaching seminarians how to take the Bible apart without ever having read it all together. So part of what I want us to think about if you read John is to read it all together as a narrative that goes straight through rather than mining it for little nice little nuggets. Uh, when I was in seminary we were taught to look for the nuggets. Uh, so we could only see the trees, we had no idea of the forest. So that's one of the things that trained. The other was a Scottish biblical scholar, James Barr, uh, who thought about much the same thing, and Reverend Childs, who was an Old Testament theologian, at, um, sometimes in the Yale Department of Religion and sometimes in the Yale Divinity School. Um, and they were saying, let's pay attention to what the narrative is. So I, I will doubtless fail, because I was trained under another system, but I've tried to convert myself, is to get you to read John uh, and let it wash over you. Now the best way to let anything in the Bible wash over to you is to read it in several versions. Um, and there are two of them that I think you, uh, everybody should own. If you don't already own this one, I urge you to buy it. And, and this is the Harper Collins, um, not the uh, uh, annotated Bible. The advantage of this over the other annotated Bible in RSV is that the annotations are new and it has great maps. I'm a big believer in maps, so I'll pass this around if you haven't seen it before, buy it. And then the, um, the other one I recommend, if you have that one, is to buy, there's an annotated version of this, it's a common English Bible. Are you familiar with that one, Colin? It's, a, it's one we will probably never read on a Sunday because when people have sex, they don't know each other, they have intercourse, and we don't believe in talking about that in church. Not sure how any of us ever got here if you don't talk about it, but, <clears throat> um, but anyway, it's a great, it's a great translation. Um, I use the markings, I use this when I read the office daily, so it's marked where the readings were yesterday. Um, so I, I urge you to do that, but to read the Bible several times. Now, something you've heard me say a lot of times is that all translations are lies. Um, this is the, this is the Greek and make sure I have it right side up. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's as close as we have to the, uh, we, this is all we have is Greek. We, as I was talking a few minutes ago, we can't go back to what Jesus said. Whatever Jesus did, he didn't speak Greek. Um, so we have this, and this is from what the, the Bibles come from. So, lots of versions. Colin, in his promotional stuff, talked about love <clears throat> and my talking about love. And the, the Gospel of John is interesting about what love means. Love does not mean, love, and I thought the sermon this morning touched on what I think John is talking about. Love is not something that we are to attain. We don't hope that you'll come to church, Bob, so you learn to love God. Um, and you can say, I've attained that now, I now know who I am, I've achieved it. Um, love instead, as, the, as John talks about it, is recognizing that God loves us. Uh, so it, it's putting the, the whole emphasis. So they're saying that you don't demonstrate, Ralph, that you love God because you behave in an ethical manner. You behave in an ethical manner because you recognize that God loves you. And you want other people to realize that by the way you behave. 
Um, so we come here, uh, love is not an achievement, love is a gift. Um, and, and John is trying to do that. So if you look for what John, if you look, if you read through John with that in mind, it says, you know, when Jesus gets crucified in John, uh, he's showing us how much God loves us. That's what he's trying. He's not trying to buy off our sins in John. He's not, he's, he's, he's saying God loves you this much. And I'm trying to show you how much God loves you. Please recognize it. It will change your life. Um, so it's also not enough just to say it's changed my life <clears throat> and so I can go and do whatever the hell I please. Um, so I've talked about that. Now the other thing that um, probably uh, almost any other priest on the staff here would be more qualified to talk about is process theology. Um, and I reinterpret that in a strange way. But what I'm saying is when you look at John and read it, look at John and say is John trying to give me age old truths is that what he's trying to give me the, the nuggets that I learned when I was in seminary or is John trying to show to me how God thinks and when I look at how God thinks what we become aware of and this is I just give it the title process theology is that God is saying I become God by my interaction with you God is not a finished product. Uh, God is saying, I'm constantly evolving by my interaction with Dawn. That that changes who I am by doing that. Which is why our prayer to God becomes important, because God is actually listening. It's not enough to say, as many of us are taught as children, God already knows everything, you don't have to tell him anything. I mean, people are constantly telling me how wonderful their prayer life is because they never ask God for anything. I thought, well, that's fine, but it seems kind of meaningless. Um, if you read the Psalms, they're pretty direct. Not only do they tell you what they want, they'll tell you who they want it to happen to. Um, and, uh, you know, God doesn't seem to back away from that. But what, what John is trying to undergird us with is an understanding that God needs us to be God. Not that God is less God if Lloyd suddenly stops believing. But God has said, you make my life interesting, Lloyd. And I want to know what you think. Because I may never have thought about it. So you've heard me preach sometimes that nowhere in the Bible does God claim to be omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Theology has put that on God. That's not, what, that's not God's claim. God is always trying to learn and become more what God is. That's why he, God created us, is so that God could have an interesting time of it. Um, so that's a, that, that's a fairly radical statement. Sir? Yeah, yeah. this radical I think really our human And you can always go with that truth, and you better how you interpret it. If God is only present, God is only present. And the way you say that God said, you know, I am God and I love you, that is our own thinking. You know? it's, it's, always, it's always our own thinking. Everything I say is fallible. Of course, you know, it's something we have to grapple with. It is, it is. And we grapple with different things at different times. Um, we started, <clears throat> the whole study of the critical study of the Bible started because people were looking at Homer that way. And they said, if we're looking at, at the Odyssey, we've got this other old text we should look at. And they began coming up with problems. And suddenly they came up with so many problems, the story was lost. We're in a time where we're trying to rediscover the story. We will get overly involved in the story and go do something else some other time. But, um, but for today, when we read John, when I read John, um, it's all about interaction. Now, I talked about that on Monday Thursday, which I think is on the web if you weren't here, and I quote from it there. Um, the, um, a couple of people have been very important to me in reading this time. <clears throat> uh, one is Adele Reinhartz. From the name, you can already tell she's kind of strange. She's a Canadian feminist Jewish Johannine scholar. There are almost no Canadian biblical scholars. She may be it. Um, there are very few feminist Johannine scholars, not for any real reason, it's just we haven't trained them. And there are essentially no Jewish Johannine scholars. Now, Amy Jill Levine wrote on the synoptics, and I think you guys read that, did you? Yeah. What's she doing now? Pardon? What's she doing Yeah. Um, Adele's, uh, uh, Reinhardt's focus has been on John 
and she's absolutely fantastic so that everything that you have probably ever heard about John she has succeeded in saying is not true that we have written it on to John that's uh, so what we keep we keep seeing in John what we want to see not what is there and the other person who's been um, interesting to me is an Hispanic uh, Fernando Segovia he's been teaching at Vanderbilt for a very long time and and he's been very good and we're reacting against um, Colin when you were in seminary were they still reading Raymond Brown okay we're reacting everything I'm saying is against the training that Colin had and that I had now Colin Brown was an old man when I went to seminary. He was dead when Colin went to seminary. Um, he taught at Union Seminary. He was a Catholic biblical scholar. Taught at um, Union. And he worried about all the nuggets. So he thought, his, if you read John, there's all this talk about the beloved disciple. You've heard about the beloved disciple? John, uh, Raymond Brown tries to figure out who the beloved disciple was. He spends chapters worrying about that. The end of it is he doesn't know. <laughs> um, so we just start out and say we don't know and we leave the question aside he also wants to talk about how many editorial versions were there for John before when he spends chapters talking about that in the end of it you don't know so we just start where we don't know um, so we've, we've sort of rejected much of what uh, what he has said um, and also Boltman I doubt you read did, were they still reading Boltman when you were in seminary oh my golly well, he was dead when I was in seminary. <laughs> um, Bulbon was an existentialist. Um, interesting, um, he's the one that really thought up the, uh, or promulgated the whole thing of um, realized eschatology. And realized eschatology, which he found in John, means that we are alive for this life only, there is no resurrection, which is kind of a hard thing to find in John since John talks so much about resurrection. <clears throat> but, you know, if you reinterpret all your terms, you can do that. And he wanted to say that the whole purpose of life was to lead the best life you had, and when you died, you were dead. Uh, Jürgen Moltmann, who is still alive, still talks about that. Um, so we, everything I'm doing is rejecting both of them um, and I think part of the reason I didn't read John was I didn't find either of them very satisfying uh, but they were until relatively recently uh, the, the reigning biblical scholars um, and now Segovia and um, Adele Reinhardt's uh, have taken the march and they're doing well another thing that you may have heard about in John is that we've said that John is a fight against Gnosticism now, I know that some of you have heard about this because I've been in front of you and said it. Um, Reinhardt and Segovia have been very clear about pointing out that Gnosticism did not exist in the first century AD. It's a much later thing. Now, Gnosticism means that um, I have God's divine spark within me. And that means I can tell who else has it. So, Pamela has it. But Joel, I'm afraid you do not. And it doesn't matter how you behave. Pamela is saved because she has the divine spark. And I'm afraid when this life ends, you're ended. That's just, that's just it. Um, that's a gross oversimplification of Gnosticism. But P.N., it talks a lot about light, dark imagery. Um, if we now reject that, that whatever the battle was, there was not a battle of Gnosticism in John. Uh, so we'll just disabuse you of that one. Um, probably an issue you haven't thought much about, um, but it was, a, it was something that was powerfully done. Um, the other problem that's a major problem in John, and you probably noticed this on Good Friday if you were here, is the portrayal of Jews in the Gospel of John. Everybody, except for Adele Reinhardt's and Ferdinand Segovia, <clears throat> believed that the Jews were hostile, that the church was hostile to the Jews because the Jews had left the church and had gone back to Judaism after the destruction of the temple. And that there had been promulgated this writ saying that you couldn't be Jewish and Christian. That in the, in the worship service, 
you had to say Jesus is anathema. And we were, we were taught that as absolute fact. Well, you know, for whatever reason, Adele Reinhardt was attracted to John. Uh, it may have been because she wanted to read this anti-Semitic book. Um, she decided to look at the history of Judaism in the late first century, early second century. And the first thing you find is that with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 or 72 AD, all central authority was gone in Judaism. So as if they all became Congos. You know, you know the old joke of uh, um, if you have a, you have a uh, shipwreck and there are 21 uh, people on the ship, seven of them are Catholic, they get off and build one church. Seven of them are Protestant, they get off and build three churches. And seven of them are Jews and they get off and build eight synagogues. <clears throat> and that's because there has to be one which I wouldn't be seen dead in. Um, <clears throat> They, they, had, they had and have no central authority in the way we think of a hierarchical central authority. So she said there was no, there was not even, the, there is certainly, there is no historical record of that ever having been said by anyone, any place. Uh, and there is no written record uh, that it was ever promulgated. So when she looked at the gospel, and, and if you read John, think about this, that she would say that it was probably a fight between Jewish members of the, of the early church over what it took. And this is what we find when you read Paul. What's the fight in Paul? Uh, among other things, the fight in Paul is whether you need to be Jewish to be Christian. Do you need to keep kosher? Do you need to circumcise your little boys? Um, what do you need to be Jewish to be Christian? It seems that a similar fight was going on within the Jewish community that were Christians. So when they're talking about the whole Yadawiwai, the Jews, they're not, they're not anti-Semitic because it was Jews fighting with Jews. Um, yes, sir. Oh, yes. Yeah, but that was still the fight that he had. Yeah, this, we have no idea when John was written. We used to say it was 110 or 120, and we said it with great, great authority, and then we said it was 90 with great authority, and now we are aware that we can't say when it was written with any authority. Uh, but it seems to, I would not be, it would not be um, out of line to say it's probably post the destruction of the temple. But the fight within the church is the same. Because remember, Jesus is Jewish, and the earliest Christians are Jewish. All the apostles are Jewish. Um, and we think the church spread from little bitty Israel, about the size of New Jersey, um, up through Syria and all the way into Turkey and Greece, probably more spread up the water. Um, and so we have in John, um, you know, a Jewish community that's wrestling with this new way of looking, and there were lots of messiahs then. We have in John probably a Greek-speaking Jewish community. There were Hellenistic Jews, um, and the... Um, and they had lost touch with this area. So you find John is the most Jewish of the four Gospels. He gets the festivals pretty right. Um, he seems to have a better, not a good understanding of geography, but a better understanding than the other, four, the other three Gospels. And John, Jesus doesn't need to teleport. Um, and, they, and to make some of the places he goes to and the others he has to teleport. But wherever John was written from, he was a long way from Jerusalem. Um, so he is writing about something he's only heard about. He's not writing about something he probably experienced. Um, I was trying to look up to be able to point to you exactly where Patmos is. I don't really believe John wrote it from Patmos, but you know, Lesbos up here has been in the newspaper and on the news quite a lot. Um, Patmos is a little island just south of, of Lesbos, um, maybe even a little south of Ephesus. Uh, these are all still Greek-controlled islands. Sylvia? Uh, there's been some indication that he was a Jewish Greek. Was yeah, a Hellenistic Jew. His thinking is, is very much molded as a Greek. A, a Jew and a Greek. Yes, yes, as a Hellenistic Greek. Um, yes, I would say he was certainly a diasporic Jew. Uh, probably grew up, as Paul did, in a Hellenistic culture. Um, unclear whether he knew Aramaic or not. 
um, but he certainly wrote in whoever he was. And again, we have no idea who he was. Common name doesn't mean anything. You know, it's, uh, it's just a, a name. Um, and so we, don't, we just don't know. So we have, uh, we, have, we, have, we have wasted an awful lot of our historical Christianity being angry at the Jews because of um, what John writes. And that wasn't John's point at all. Uh, so we need to get over our anger at the Jews. We know that Judaism was uneven in this period in the, in the kosher laws, in Sabbath laws, and circumcision laws. They hadn't done them at all until 500 years before. Um, so it was a very uneven time as to what the practice was. And we have imposed upon it uh, clarity that we really don't have. Now the other question, another question that comes up a lot is, did John know Matthew, Mark, and Luke? We don't have a clue as to whether he did or not. Um, we generally believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are more historical than John. There is no reason for us to believe that. We've just asserted that. You know, many things, we make assertions that don't have proofs. And one of the subtle things in, um, that we accept Totally. If I say, how long did Jesus preach for? How long did he preach for? Three years. Three years? Why? Anybody know why we say three? You can read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you can get it all done in a year. Why is it three? Three Passovers in John. So we, we don't like most of John's historicity, but we accept the three Passovers that he has. Um, how about the crucifixion? What day does the crucifixion occur on in John? Jesus is the Paschal Lamb. No, it's a Friday. But, but what, what it, it, the crucifixion in John is a different year than the crucifixion in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a Last Supper, Passover meal. In John, the crucifixion happens on the first day of Passover. So Jesus is the Lamb that was sacrificed in John. Um, I've never heard how fundamentalists get away with trying to reconcile that. And we have, Barbara and I have a friend at St. Mary's who is a very complicated way of doing that, which is really peculiar to him. Um, you can't, John has no birth narrative. Um, Mary is never named in John. If you read it, look, you can find Mary ever named. Uh, how many times does Jesus deny, as does Peter deny Jesus? And that's in each of the Gospels, right? Three times, all four Gospels. How many people does he deny Jesus to? Seven different people. Um, all meant to remind us that the Gospels are not histories. There, you know, Walter Cronkite was not there. Uh, he was not saying, um, all things are as they were then, except you are there. Um, so there are already some interesting problems in the text. All of that is to free us from trying to read the text as history. The text is, has a very different purpose. The text is trying to convert you and me into being disciples. Not trying to convert you and me into figuring out what the ethics of the New Testament are. It wants us to be disciples and it wants us to realize that God loves us enough to have never given up on us. And we are given the opportunity to recognize what that love is uh, and then how that changes. So God doesn't love me more because I'm a priest um, because it's impossible for God to love me more um, than God already loved Bob. It's just impossible, or Rod, or Lloyd, or anybody. Um, so we can't do anything to earn God's love. And so the gospel is trying to say, relax, you've got it all. Now just live as if you have it all. And that's where we keep having the problem. We want to say, okay, God, what do I have to do to be sure you'll accept me? And God says, you're off on the wrong foot. You're accepted. John, you're accepted. Now go and behave like it. Behave with the confidence there's nothing you can do that will make me reject you. <clears throat> now I will let you reject me. And Barbara and I saw um, in January <clears throat> at the Pearl Theater 
off or maybe off off <clears throat> um, uh, the great divorce and the great divorce is a, you know if you haven't read the book read the book and read it this afternoon <clears throat> uh, it's a great was a great play um, and what it talks about is the thing that would keep Patricia out of heaven is not because God doesn't love Patricia but because she has resentments against me uh, so God is saying I will respect your rejection I will not overwhelm you so that you have to love me but if you will accept that I love you then all everything is there for you am I clear or clear as mud yeah, yeah Rod what happens when you Continue to be well, that's what the great divorce is all about. It is saying that if when you die, you die full of resentments against your partners for whatever reason, then you will not go to heaven. Um, you will go to hell. And it defines, Ralph, if you could pour me some while you're over there, that would be great. My cup's right here. Oops, just warm that up, please. Um, trouble only having one hand I can't get my coffee I'm make, making bring it here but um, what you know what C.S. Lewis talks about and he does it better than any theologian I've ever read it says there's a bus that goes from heaven to hell every day and anybody can get off the bus and stay in heaven but if you don't give up your resentments you won't stay uh, but it suggests I, I thought that you would continue to stay on the bus after you yeah you come back try again you can keep coming back to heaven over and over and over again. Yeah, infinite number of times. Um, but some of us, you know, one of the things that John has freed me from was the belief that God was like me. Um, because if God is like me, then God is unbelievably judgmental and, and will point out what the errors were and say, okay, Rod, you're, you're doing 50% better than yesterday, but boy, <laughs> you know, Every journey starts with a small step, and that's all you've done. And um, we wish you luck. And fortunately, what John is saying is that's not the way God behaves at all. You know, God is saying, I love you. Would you please just accept that I love you? And if you say, I'm not ready yet, then God says, that's okay. I will still be there. So, so death matters or doesn't matter? Death doesn't matter. Um, as I've said in, a, in a, several sermons over the years, when I was uh, in 1992... I was the interim at Grace Church in Norwalk, a church that no longer exists. Um, and one Sunday, it was, it was an unair conditioned church, as this was at that time, and it was just too hot at, for the 8 o'clock Eucharist, so we went outside and had communion under a tree. And so as is my want when I'm outside, when I'm in these kind of things, I just said, I'm going to pass... You know, the, the reason the priests are supposed to give the patent of the, the bread uh, is so that you'll have to hire more of us. <clears throat> there is no theological reason. The bread is not holier than the cup. It used to be when I was a boy, the only priest could do the cup too. That's the full employment of clergy rubric. Um, but people have put all this amazing stuff. And if you want to drive me nuts, give me the bread and say a little prayer for me. I thought, oh, it doesn't matter who you are, just give me the bread. But a lot of clergy like to personalize the thing. Um, and um, so we were all in a circle and this very conservative man uh, was standing there and there were women on either side of him. And so the woman gave him the cup and he sort of took that reluctantly. And then she gave him the, she gave him the bread rather than the cup. He wouldn't take the bread because women can't touch Jesus. I'm not sure where you find that in the Gospels, but we know it's true, don't we? Um, and so, so he came to me afterwards and said, I consigned his wife, his dead wife, to another year in purgatory. And I said, well, first, nobody believes in purgatory anymore. Even the Catholics have rejected it. Um, because he had promised God, this was a non-church-going wife, that if God would accept his wife and take years off her time in purgatory, he promised to attend Mass every Sunday. And I said, I think you're in the wrong church. <clears throat> and he left. Became a Catholic. Um, so, I mean, you know, for me, the good news is that God has said, I love you, and I will love you into eternity. I, th I think that's what John is talking about, is, is that there is nothing you can do that will make God stop loving you. 
then, you know, we like to tie theologians, you know, seminarians up in knots, and we talk about, well, did you love Pol Pot or did you love Hitler? That's not really my problem. My problem is God has said, I will love you, period. Um, you know, in, in Lewis, he talks about Napoleon being in the furthest reaches of hell um, because he, he would not, he didn't want to consort with other people and then the great divorce. So you, you can say, if you want to send yourself to hell, you have every possibility of doing that. God has said, I will not send you there. It's, now that's radically different than anything we grew up with. But if you start to read John and let it wash over you, now the other, one of the tools I'll be using is called audience criticism. And that means that, um, that we try and figure out what John means by figuring out what the people he wrote it for had questions about. Because as, the, as that verse I read you in the beginning said, um, there are many other things that are not written in this gospel, but this is written so that you might believe and become his disciples. Uh, so, uh, audience criticism is, why did they choose this stuff? What was Ralph's question that this could answer? And so they figured it out, and they, they put it down. So, what scholars try and do is to figure out what were the questions, and there we get to that. So, we will, uh, we will do some of that. Um, you know, we are, as I mentioned a couple times, we are, even the Greek, anybody still own a red-letter Bible? Everybody knows what a red letter Bible is? Red letter Bible are the words, especially King James, where the words of Jesus were in red. Yeah. Um, you know why we call things a red letter day? Fiona, you're the Brit. Um, especially in the, in the British prayer book, but continuing into the 1928 prayer book, holy days were in red. So red letter day meant it was a holy day where it's a feast, so you didn't have to do that. But red letter was supposed to be, if the Bible said Jesus said it, an ipsissima verba that was put in red. Well, we know that whatever Jesus said, he didn't say anything in Greek. Uh, so everything we have is an interpretation. There are no Aramaic manuscripts. A lot of people have uh, tried to find them. Um, my, um, my otherwise anonymous wife <coughs> has been a fan of Marcus Borg forever. Um, and uh, he was big in the Jesus Project with uh, Robert Funk. And they were trying to figure out which things were authentically Jesus. Uh, the whole scholarly world rejected everything they did because they said, we can't know. Uh, that what we can know is we can read the whole narrative. And if you read the whole narrative, we come up with a very different thing. So we know that uh, what we assume or what we think is true is that John was written for an audience that had less curiosity about what went on in Palestine than we do. Certainly written with an audience that had less curiosity, infinitely less curiosity, about what women do with their bodies and about whether gay people can be married than we do. Um, because the only reason they saved the text was Jesus died and rose again. That's what makes us Christian. Our position on abortion, birth control, gay marriage, transgender clergy, um, nuclear weapons have nothing to do with what the gospel is about. The gospel is about saying, if you can believe that Jesus died and rose again, you are Christian. So people put together all these fantastic things talking about the ethics of the New Testament, the ethic of love. I'm not sure where they get that. Um, without reading the New Testament. Of course, if you start reading the Gospels, it's a little scary because they're pretty judgmental. Um, but Jesus, the early church, was uninterested in the so-called dominical sayings and what Jesus had to say that we use. So we have right going, going right now in Lusaka, Kenya. Is that where it is? The uh, Anglican Consultative Council. Uganda, thank you. Um, and... Um, all of these conservative African bishops and some conservative um, um, Near Eastern bishops aren't going because the church is not sticking to what Jesus said. So they have missed the point of the gospel. The point of the gospel is not what you think about homosexuals. The point of the gospel is to accept that you are loved, that Jesus died and rose again for you so that you would know that you are loved and can go out and give that to other people even homosexuals, even people who are on their way into the abortion clinic. 
Um, and we, because we're post-Constantine, post-313, say, no, no, no. We have to have some clarity about what the rules are. And the rules are clear that all life is sacred when they're really saying, I'm giving away, well, you know my politics anyway, uh, they're giving away, um, <laughs> Barbara's scratching her head, um, it's interesting that pro-life people tend to be pro-potential life people, but once it's born, it's your problem, why do you have